Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kat, and I am a program coordinator with the Friends of Laurel Hill. Um, I appreciate you being out here tonight. Every attendance that you give to an event is part of our mission in helping us to preserve, promote, and protect our historic cemeteries, Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West. Um, so tonight we have a wonderful virtual tour um, of Laurel Hill West given by Dr. Joe Lex, who is the host of our podcast, All Bones Considered, on top of many, many other accomplishments. Um, so I will turn it over to Joe and throughout the tour, if you have questions, you can use the question and answer button at the bottom um, and Joe will get to them as he's able. And if you have something that is not a question directly related to this tour, you can put it in the chat um, and we'll get to those as well. This is being recorded and it will be sent out to you um, after this evening so that you can have it to watch. And with that, I give you to Joe. And good evening to you. If you wonder what all those letters mean, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I retired seven years ago. The, the MD is no longer valid. But that is my email address if you want to get in touch with me. Um, and I'll show that again at the end, just as, okay, it's, there we go. Just as at the end, I will show the QR code again. That's what you scan to get to the podcast, All Bones Considered. If you're looking at that logo and saying that looks sort of familiar, that is the Hugh Mercer mausoleum before the top got knocked off and then put back on upside down. If you go to Hugh Mercer's mausoleum now, um, or marker now, th this thing is upside down. Two podcasts that I do, All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories. And those really are stories. I try to get a topic and then put several people in with that topic. Whereas Biographical Bites from Bala is usually a little shorter. It's about one, maybe two people at Laurel Hill West. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about 10 of my favorite people at Laurel Hill West. This is the third year that I've done this. And the other two, the first two are on YouTube, if you want to go there. My username is JRLexJR. If you put that in, it'll take you right to the virtual podcasts or the virtual tours that I've done for Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West. You can do your own self-guided tour at Laurel Hill East with this app. This is a terrific self-guided tour. And you will see 28 people at Laurel Hill West. I'm not going to talk about these people on my virtual podcast or on my virtual tours because you can hear about them here. This is a really, really nicely done app. You can hear about all of these people. They are all buried at East. Now, there's not a professional tour for West. However, I have recorded stories about, I'm going to say, 40 or 50 people on each side of the road. If you come into Laurel Hill West from Barmouth, from the Kinwood Heritage Trail and walk to Pencoid. It's less than a mile, but I've done a tour going in that direction for everybody on the right side of the road. Then you can turn around, come back and listen to stories about everybody on the right side of the road again as you're coming back. Those are available from the podcast site. Just go to the podcast site. These are the 10 people I'm gonna tell you about tonight. Lena Collette Vare, who was the best American female golfer of the early 20th century. No, I am not exaggerating. Joseph Miller Houston was an architect who did a gorgeous job on the state capitol, but unfortunately got caught up in fraud, and he ended up spending time at Eastern State Penitentiary. An Olympic caliber slalom skier who gave up Innsbruck, the Winter Olympics of 1960, so she could get married. Author, naturalist, paleontologist, humanitarian. You can see he's sitting in front of the Penn Museum here. That background should look familiar. That is Lauren Isley, an amazing, amazing writer. The founder and the owner of RCA Victor, but also the owner of Alice's Adventures in the Underground. He owned the original manuscript for about 20 years. Three sisters who started a prep school for women going to college, especially Bryn Mawr. They were actually located right next to Bryn Mawr. Well, they still are located next to the Bryn Mawr campus. 
a very rich, very handsome man who had an amazing collection of early American um, silverware, furniture, artwork, what have you. It's in the museum now. I'll talk about him. I'll talk about Bernard, uh, Beatrice uh, Fenton, a sculptor who was probably equivalent only to Harriet Frischmuth, who's buried at East. William Wagner, who was a big believer in free education and started a museum, which is still there, but it looks like it did 130 years ago. We'll talk about that. And then we'll finish with Bushrod Washington, ophthalmologist, philanthropist. And if you live in the Northeast, yes, Bushrod Library is named for this man. Plus, you're going to get some healthy dose of Frank Furness. Frank Furness is buried at East. But if we had buzzers, I wish we had buzzers. So every time you saw a Frank Furness reference, you could buzz in and say, I know that, that that's what you're talking about with Furness. I've labeled them instead, though. So let's start with Glenna Collette Vare, an amazing woman. Her burial site is just off. This is the Ginkgo Alley. Here's the entrance. Kinwood Heritage Trail, Barmouth. The funeral home is over here. Here is the Ginkgo Alley, and she is buried right here. And behind this bubble is the Ludens Mausoleum. So she's buried right behind Ludens in the Vare family plot. Collette, or Glenna's father, um, George Collette, was a world champion bicyclist. And in fact, he was out of the country at a competition, at a world competition in Paris when Glenna was born. Glenna took to sports when she was young. Uh, she had a brother a couple of years older than her, but Glenna would play third base with her brother and his friends because she could throw the ball better from third base than the boys could. Uh, as a young teen, she became very accomplished in tennis, but she didn't like tennis all that much. She saw her father play golf and she said, that's the game for me. The first time she picked up a club, she was 10 years old and she goes with her father to the Marion East um, and she says can I try and everybody kind of chuckles and says sure go ahead and she picks up a club and hits the ball 100 yards straight down the fairway which kind of shut everybody up um, she had to learn of course it was it was a lucky drive in a way but still how many people can hit a ball 100 yards straight the first time they pick up a golf club she was also a very accomplished archer and a very accomplished skeet shooter. She took lessons from a pro. Her father set up a sheet in the backyard where she could hit hundreds of shots every night. And don't forget, this is a woman who is using hickory clubs. None of the fancy fiberglass that we have now. None of the metal clubs. These were hickory clubs. And she was bashing the ball in this case in 1922. Um, pushing the ball from 265 to 290 yards, counting the rolls. One day she sent it 307 yards. 19-year-old girl hits a drive 307 yards. It actually made the newspaper. This is in the days before professional golf. There's no such thing as pro golf. She started winning the amateur tournaments when she was 19 years old. And she just kept collecting them through the next few years. Here she is for baseball fans. Here she is giving a lesson to Ty Cobb. No, Ty, you don't hold the club that way. You hold it this way. She um, won. She was 1924. She was the first woman to break 80 on the U.S. amateur circuit. In 1924, she played 60 competitive rounds. She lost one. You're going to have to listen to the podcast to find out how she lost that round because it's a pretty amazing story. She won the U.S. National in 1922, 25, 28, 29, and 30. And she reached the finals in 31 and 32. It was in 1931 that she got engaged to Edwin H. Vare Jr. If you know Philadelphia politics, you know who Edwin H. Vare Sr. was. He was one of the, he was a state senator. He was one of the Dukes of South Philadelphia. The Vares controlled South Philadelphia. They controlled the sesquicentennial. There is a future podcast about them coming up. Glenna and Edwin had two children. Surprisingly, the children were named Glenna and Edwin. Uh, 
She decided she wasn't finished, though. She'd had five, won five amateur cups. She said, I would like to see my new name on a cup. So she got back into this tournament again. And in 1935, she won her sixth amateur. This is a record that will never be broken. Truly, because women don't stay amateur long enough to win six. So she has won more amateur competition than anybody ever will um, during her lifetime. I just realized something. Okay, I'm going to move that up there. It's something I had to adjust on, on my screen here. Um, 1935, like I say, she saw her new name on the cup. By the way, this is a young Patty Berg that Glenna kind of took under her wing. She beat Patty the first time she played her, but Patty went on to become another great, probably the best golfer in the middle third, excuse me, of the 20th century. Glenna led the Curtis Cup team for years. She played in four Curtis Cups. She was captain in four of them. By the way, nothing to do with Cyrus Curtis. Cyrus Curtis is actually buried across the street from her, though. Um, and she was credited with 49 wins in amateur tournaments. Remember, 60 competitive rounds in one year. She lost one. But she won 49 amateur tournaments between 1921 and 1935. And she played golf for the rest of her life. Her last championship was in 1959. In 1984, when she was 81 years old, she had a 15 handicap. And she could still drive further than women one-third her age. She is a charter member of the Women's Golf Hall of Fame. This is her portrait, which is in the Women's Golf Hall of Fame. In 1965, she was awarded the Bob Jones Award by the U.S. Golf Association. And since 1953, the golfer with the lowest scoring average on the LPGA tournament every year gets the Vair Award. Naturally, the first winner was Patty Berg. Edwin Vare died in 1975. His cremains went into his father's vault. Glenna kept playing into her 80s. She died in 1989 of lymphoma. Her cremains are with her husband, and she has no marker. The greatest woman golfer of the first third of the 20th century is in an unmarked grave. It doesn't have her name on it. It's not unmarked. It's got her father-in-law's name on it. But her ashes are down on the shelf right here. Her, her husband is number eight, and she is number nine. And when I was when I discovered her last summer, um, I was researching another podcast and found her. And I got in touch with the Inquirer. I said, you know, we've got this famous golfer buried at Laurel Hill West. That was in, I'm going to say it was in August and November, they did come out with a big story about her. So I was really proud about that. They didn't mention my name. They didn't mention the podcast, but at least they did a story about Glenna and said how great she was. Next up is Joseph Miller Houston, an architect. He was the fifth of six children of Irish immigrants. He's buried way over in a section that we don't get to very often. Writer's Ferry Road, back entrance, Pet Cemetery. And how many people actually go over to this side? There's a lot of interesting stuff over here. But Joseph Miller Houston is buried way back in the corner there. Okay, there's our first furnace alert. Uh, he studied architecture when he was 17, and he joined Frank Furness's office in the 1880s, stayed with him for five years. He went out on his own in 1895, and one of his early assignments was this magnificent Witherspoon building, the Presbyterian Board of Publications. Um, the first time I really looked closely at this building is when there was construction going on at Locust. And uh, the, the building was sort of blocked off so I could stand in the street and look at it and all of the details here. This is a magnificent building. Look at some of this details. 11 stories, lots of terracotta. And this was enough to gain him the contract for the state capitol building in Harrisburg. He was given a $4 million budget. He had a lot of really good ideas 
but he had little experience. So he traveled Europe and he borrowed what he saw there. So the dome of the capital in Harrisburg is based on the dome of St. Peter's. Now he thought both on the large scale, look at these, look at these wonderful murals here by Violet Oakley. And um, no, these are not Cornelius. I was going to say these are by Robert Cornelius. Robert Cornelius did the, the lights that are in the state cap, are they the U.S. Capitol, not the state capital. So just to show you, this is from this morning's Inquirer, the front page of the Inquirer this morning. And that is where the governor gave his press conference yesterday is right there in the in the dome of the state capitol. It is a gorgeous building. If you haven't visited, you've got to go on a guided tour there. But the details are what are really interesting also. When you go, many of the door handles are actually sculptures of like the governor at the time, the attorney general at the time. Joseph Miller Houston did one that his own face that shows you the kind of details that are on the doors there. Some of the details in the rooms, again, the Violet Oakley murals on the walls. It's an absolutely stunning building. It really is. Lots of material from the Mercer Tile Works in Doylestown. This Mercer is not related to Hugh Mercer, by the way. I mean, he may be, but it's a very distant relationship. And this is his home. This is Oik's Close Cloisters on Wissahickon Avenue in Germantown. This was crumbling 30 years ago when Russ Harris, another ER doc, a guy I've known for years, uh, bought this with his partner. And the two of them invested much money that I don't even want to estimate. But they have got this place pretty much looking like it was when um, Houston lived there. This is the receiving room. This is the door you come in back here. And this is the receiving room. And believe me, the upstairs is just as gorgeous as the downstairs. Russ has put so much time and money into this. Now, unfortunately, what happened with Mr. Miller is the final cost was a lot more than he had estimated. And when you read closely, it seems like Miller, uh, Miller Houston, uh, I'm sorry, Houston was taken in by subcontractors. A couple of them are buried at Laurel Hill East. You can hear about that in the podcast, number 49 on white collar crime. Um, but he actually spent several months uh, in Houston State or Eastern State Pen Penitentiary, seven months behind bars. And he did not visit the Capitol until he came out of prison. It was the first time he saw the completed Capitol was after he'd finished his prison sentence. I think he was a scapegoat for the shortcomings of the state and the dishonesty of others. I think he probably made a couple of mistakes. I don't think that he was the big bad guy uh, who deserved to serve seven months in prison. The main guy who cheated the state died during the trial. And they said, well, somebody's got to go to jail for this. So it turned out it was going to be Joseph Houston, the architect. And it kind of left him, uh, when he got out of um, prison, needless to say, he had a hard time getting gigs after that. This is another favorite. This is Sally Diver Murray. This is a young girl who loved speed. Now, she is in turn not far. This is the Luden Mausoleum I was telling you about. This is the Ver plot right here. That's where Glenna Collette Ver is buried. Sally is buried right over here. Her, her father was a big deal surgeon at Lankanaw. If, if you know anything about the history of Lankanaw Hospital, it was, it was called before the Great War, the German Hospital, not Germantown Hospital, the German Hospital, the two different things. But J. Montgomery Deaver was the chief of surgery at um, Lankanaw for years and then her grandfather was this monster this is john b deaver md he was one of the fathers of american surgery his nickname was the great slasher and he did up to 20 surgeries on saturday afternoons when there would be visitors in town from all over the united states he was uh, he was a very conceited man but he was a conceited man who was very good at what he did even with that nickname, the Great Slicer. Uh, 
Now, Sally grew up at Chestnut Hill. She went to Springside School. She learned to ski when she was about 10 years old, when she went to North Country School in Lake Placid, New York. Uh, her race career started after she took a ski vacation in Chile. She dropped out of Vassar, never went back to school, and she became a ski bum. She caught that ski bum in the Andes. She spent three seasons there under the guidance and coach of Buddy Werner on the left, Tom Corcoran on the right, two of the great skiers of the 50s. Her best results were in 1956. She won the National Women's Slalom Championship and the National Women's, the National, National Women's Giant Slalom Championship and Championship. Okay, what's the difference? Slalom has about 180 degree or 180 meter drop from beginning to end. There are 40 to 60 gates. You can reach about 50 miles an hour on your skates. Grand Slalom, the drop is 250 to 400 meters, and there are 46 to 58 gates. So there, there may be fewer gates with the Grand Slalom than there are with the Slalom. Super G, Super Grand Slalom, is a 350 to 600 meter drop and 28 to 45 gates. Super G, they usually hit about 80 miles an hour on those skis. Now, I checked the skis that she used, because this was about the time when Harold Prince's skis were, were invading the market. I think we're a little early for Prince's skis here. These are Rossignol skis. It's a French ski manufacturer. So Sally, again, won the National Women's Giant Slalom in 57. She captained the U.S. women's team in the 1958 World Alpine Championships. But she turned down a chance to be part of the 1960 U.S. Olympic team training squad because she'd fallen in love. She married Benjamin H. Murray, who was five years her senior. He was a lawyer. He was a steeplechase rider. He was a horse trainer. And he was with the Marines in the Korean War, where he was awarded the Navy Cross for heroism. Sally never had a serious accident while she was skiing. She came close one time, almost went into a mine shaft, but she was never injured. She got into her husband's hobby, which was horses, and she was training a horse in jumping. When she was thrown from the horse, the horse fell on her, killed her instantly. And she was 29 years old when she died. 1978, she was inducted into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame and Museum. Um, I asked myself what might have been. She died at 29 in 1963. The next year, her husband died of cancer, and he was only 36 years old. It just mind-boggling there is an annual sally deaver memorial super g race up in maine and she is on the sports tour that i'm giving on may 18th i give a tour on may 18th about sports heroes buried at laurel hill west this to me is one of the more remarkable scholars to ever have shared his life's work that is lauren isley he is interred in the west lawn section of laurel hill west very unstable family. He was born in Lincoln, Nebraska. His father was an amateur actor, excuse me, and a salesman. Her mother was an artist who was deaf and had psychological problems. He spent time exploring the nature around Nebraska, visited the University of Nebraska Museum, trying to escape his family's instability, his mother's disability. Um, he wrote once that his mother was on the brink of metal collapse. I couldn't find a better picture, but this is his wife. He married Mabel Langdon in 1938 at Nebraska, and they never had children. He spent eight years balancing academics, coping with physical and psychological problems at the University of Nebraska, but he did participate in their first archaeological dig. He wrote and published poetry for the first time. And he discovered his interest in nature. He got his BA in 1933 came to Penn, got his MA in 1935, his PhD in 37, and his first job, he went back to University of Kansas. He was associate professor of sociology and anthropology at uh, Camp 
uh, canvas. He did come to Penn in 58. He took the job as provost at Penn. He was curator of the early man exhibition at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. These are not the Morton skulls. It's too early for the Morton. So the Morton skulls were still over at the um, Academy of Natural Sciences. Published several novels and poetry collections. He wrote a lot of essays and he put these essays together into novels and, and just beautiful writing. I don't know how else to describe it. He uses anecdotes. He observes scientific subjects. Um, lots of essays in magazines. Harper's Magazine loved him. Scientific American, the American Scholar Magazine, Science. Even Saturday Evening Post would publish his stuff. He did publish an autobiography called All the Strange Hours. He wrote it a couple of years before he died. I'll let you read this because I love this quote. All the Strange Hours was his autobiography, but he's also had two biographies. And if you want to do a biography of Lauren Isley at the University of Penn, they have 164 cubic feet of material of primary source material, um, including his 35 honorary degrees. His best known work is probably the star thrower. Although judgment of the birds has to rank right up there. I love this quote. This is one of the better descriptions of life that I have seen. Um, his books have been gathered into collections, collected into sets. The Lauren Isley Society continues to spread the word about his accomplishments, keeps his name alive. As I said, two biographies so far. And he has my second favorite inscription on his stone. We love the earth, but could not stay. In case you're wondering, my favorite is Henry Sturgis, or Henry Sandwith Drinker. It's um, the sun shall not be up so soon as I to try the fair adventure of tomorrow. What a great thing to have written on your stone. <laughs> Next up, Eldridge Reeves Johnson, who is in a nice mausoleum as you're walking along the bike route from Pencoid to Barmouth. This is where you make the turn on that bike route. And uh, yes, I did include him on the audio that I did for self-guided tour. Born in Wilmington, Delaware. His mother died when he was two years old. He was slow in the school. His teacher said, learn a trade. You're too stupid to go to college. So he did. He took a job working 60 hours a week as an apprentice, repairing heavy machinery that's used for printing and wire stitching. Then he started his own company and spent two years redesigning an improved bookbinding machine. He patented it in 1893, and it was very successful. But then in February of 1896, a customer brought him a gramophone, this funny thing that played music off of a disc that was hand cranked. And the customer said to Johnson, can you design a spring motor for this so I don't have to keep cranking it? Uh, and he worked on it, uh, but the, the customer actually rejected the design that he had. But he did become enamored with this idea of a machine that talked. Now, he couldn't use the name gramophone. That was Thomas Edison's. Um, by the way, the Grammys the other night, actually named for the, obviously named for the gramophone. Uh, back in 58, when they were trying to figure out the name for the awards, the first name they came up with was the Eddies. They were going to be the Eddies, named for Thomas Edison. But instead, they changed it to the Grammys for his invention. Um Let's see, where are we? 97. Had to give up the name gramophone. He came up with the name Victrola, Victor, Vic, Victory, Victrola. And he became enamored by a painting of a dog listening to his master's voice. And that became the mascot for RCA. Victor Talking Machine Company of Camden, New Jersey. He incorporated on 3 October 1901. Eldridge Johnson was president. He had 60% of the company's stock. And before the year was out, there was an organization of 10,000 dealers with Victrolas. 
and he got into the recording business. And the first catalog was mainly military bands, recitations, and comedies. 1902 sold 1.7 million records. 1904, $3 million worth. 1905, $12 million. Quadrupled the record sales of RCA uh, records in one year. And by 1907, he was making $27 million a year from the records and Victrolas. He patented improvements in all of these devices. <coughs> Excuse me. He made money hand over fist. The devices got more complicated along the way. He married Elsie Reeves Fenmore, a um, relative, I think a cousin of James Fenimore Cooper, uh, who outlived him by 16 years. And the man who was too stupid for college was making more money than in his wildest dreams. The Camden plant continued to expand. Nipper became much better known. That's the, the mascot, Nipper. He finally decided he wanted to buy a yacht. He found this one called the Caroline. I'm sorry for the poor quality. That's the only uh, picture of it that I could find. This was a big yacht. This is a yacht that required 42 crew members. Now, here comes the fun part. 1928, he ran into his good friend, the bookseller, A.S.W. Rosenbach. Rosenbach had recently acquired the original manuscript of Alice's Adventures Underground. The original 10-year-old Alice Little, for whom Carol had written this book in 1864 as a Christmas gift. He told the story in 1862. It took him two years to get it written down. And then he gave it to Alice as a Christmas gift in 1864. Alice obviously treasured this, led a fascinating life. You read, read Alice Little's biography. It's amazing. But late in life, Alice needed money. Alice owned this for 64 years, and she needed money. Um, the bidding at the auction house started at 5,000 pounds. British Museum dropped out at 12,500 pounds. Last British dealer dealt, uh, dropped out at 15,200 pounds. Rosenbach got it for 15,400. That's about four times the reserve price. 15,400 pounds in 1928 is $75,260 then, about $1.2 million now. So Johnson wanted this book very, very badly. And Rosenbach was able to double his investment. He paid $150,000 for it. And three weeks later, he got $300,000 for it from Eldridge Reeves Johnson. So he doubled his investment. Johnson kept this book in a steel cabinet that was constructed to look like mahogany with unbreakable glass, which he put on the Caroline. He kept the original Alice on his yacht so he could show it to visitors to the yacht. I'm pleased to report that years later, Alice did get to visit the original manuscript and Eldridge Reeve Johnson, probably at Rosenbach's house, if I remember correctly. This is what he did with his money. He did a lot of good with his money. He sold interest in RCA Victor in 1927 for $25 million. So he got out before the Great Depression hit. He was a member of the Board of Trustees for UPenn for 20 years, 1929, an endowment of $800,000 with the E.R. Johnson Foundation for Research and Medical Physics. It's now the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. He donated his house and property in Hazelhurst Avenue in Lower Marion to be used as a memorial for the 81 men from Marion Station who served in the Great War. Now this is a public space. This is used for weddings, bar mitzvahs, birthday parties. It's a beautiful building, very plain inside, but it's a gorgeous building on the outside, beautiful grounds. And then there's the Johnson Victrola Museum down in Dover, Delaware, which I am embarrassed to say I've never been to. He has a huge collection of nippers. And in 1985, Eldridge Reeves Johnson posthumously received 
1984 Grammy Trustee Award given to persons who made a significant contribution in the field of recording. It's on display at the Johnson, or, yeah, the Johnson Victrola Museum. I'm pleased to report when he died in 1945, Alice went back on the auction block. Rosenbach bought it again. This time he only paid $50,000 for it. And in 1948, after the war, donated it back to the British Museum where it belonged. It really belongs in Britain. Can you imagine paying $50,000 for the original manuscript of Alice? Wow. Eldridge Reeves Johnson is interred in the family mausoleum in November of 1945. He was 78 years old when he died. And he, the company is still known as RCA Victor. It still has the name that he gave it back in 1901. Okay, we're halfway through the people, halfway. Are there any questions? No questions, no chat. Right, I'm going to take a drink of water, do the same. And if there are no questions, and I still don't see any, I'm going to move on. The Shipley Sisters. three sisters who started the college prep school. They are buried under one stone. They never married right here. Unfortunately, the bubble is hiding. It's behind the, the um, Patterson mausoleum. Uh, well, I'll tell you who's behind the bubble. It's kind of fun who's behind the bubble. Um, I'll show it to you toward the end when I show you a picture of their gravestone. I did a whole podcast about educating girls in Philadelphia. 1848, the city, this is before the consolidation. Remember, up until 1854, um, Philadelphia went river to river and vine to south. That was the entire city. Um, everything else was suburbs. So before the consolidation of 1854, this is girls' normal school, an early attempt to prepare girls to be teachers. Anytime you see that term normal, that means they're teaching you to be a teacher. Um Soon the new girls' normal school took its place. And when that moved to Alney, this bu building was taken over by this. The um, Masterman, Julia R. Masterman Magnet School. I'm going there in a couple of weeks. Um, I adjudicate for the Independence Awards, the High School Musical Awards. And I think they're doing Beauty and the Beast. But I'm seeing it there in a couple of weeks. Real nice auditorium there. It's also very old. I mean, most of the inside of this school still looks like it's about 100 years old. Uh, Julia Masterman, by the way, is buried at Laurel Hill West. I may do a podcast about her one of these days. She's in the Moreland section. Now, when Bryn Mawr College started in 1878, schools started prepping girls to go there. The first one, which actually predates Bryn Mawr by a few years, is Agnes Irwin. Uh, Agnes Irwin was a what, granddaughter, great-granddaughter of Benjamin Franklin, started a school for girls, moved out of out of town. It's got a beautiful campus now out in, uh, oof, forgotten where. I've been there, too. I saw a musical there last year. And the second group was the Baldwin sisters. Comments? Uh, okay. Um, their field house at Springside. That's a good question. I don't know. It could very well be named for her since um, uh, she was the athlete and she went there. Or oh, no, no, she did. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. Believe me, there are plenty of various that things could be named after. Um, this is your second uh, furnace alert, by the way. That is a hotel that Frank Furness built out in Bryn Mawr, very close to the college. And the hotel went out of business, but the Baldwin sisters um, bought it in 1878. No relation to Matthias Baldwin, by the way, um, and started prepping girls. And then the third one came along, and that was the Mrs. Shipley School for Girls. Hannah, 44, Elizabeth, 35. Catherine 26. They started with the school in their home 
And this was their curriculum. And I love this instruction here. Look at this. Careful attention given to sight translation, Greek, Latin, French, and German. These are high school girls. Each student is encouraged to cultivate a taste for the English classics. Constant practice in writing is required. And they started with... How many? Actually, I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is their father. This is um, Murray Shipley, born in 1830, died 1899. He was a Cincinnati businessman, devoutly religious. People actually called him reverend or father. This is the one photo of Hannah that I could find. Apparently, the painter could only find the same photo. Elizabeth, well, Hannah, Hannah had actually studied at a school that was run by her cousin, Catherine, who was a, and then she became a house mother at Bryn Mawr College. So she was undisputedly, the, the, the master of Shipley School was Hannah. Hannah was in charge. Elizabeth studied at Wellesley. She became the business manager, but she was the athlete. She was the one who would play field hockey with the girls and just beat the crap out of them, <laughs> run up and down the field. There's a, there's a book about the founding of the Shipley School that's fascinating. I'll show you the cover in a couple of minutes. And then there was poor Catherine. Catherine actually went to Bryn Mawr, one of the early classes, graduated in 1890. She had some kind of a fall. It wasn't really clear what happened, but she finished college from bed because of an injury she suffered and then she was plagued by ill health pretty much for the rest of her life now this was their first school six students and nine faculty tuition with board with board 500 to 800 dollars a year day pupils paid anywhere from 100 to 150 dollars in nine years they had expanded the new building now they had 70 students 20 teachers in case you're curious, the current tuition at Shipley for pre-K is $23,500. For high school, it's $42,200 per year with no boarding to go to high school. This Shipley school has lots of traditions, the maypole dance that they have every year. Their school model, which, motto, which was actually suggested by their father, fortiter in re, lenitere in modo. What does that mean? That means courage for the deed, grace for the doing. It's a wonderful book about the founding of the school. Lots of graduates you would know, anthropologist Helen Fisher, um, author Jessica Cole, Margareta Large Fitty Fittler, Happy Rockefeller, uh, the second lady of the United States. When Gerald Ford was president, Rockefeller was pr uh, vice president, and his wife was the second lady. Um, her, yes, she's related to the Fittlers at Laurel Hill Cemetery. Edward Fittler was his, her great-grandfather, as was Meat, General George Meat. Um, who else? Uh, producer, director, Sarah Megan Thomas. Let's see. Equity. A Call to Spy, Backwards, various other movies. Many other people whose names you would recognize are indeed alumni or alumni, excuse me, of Shipley School, although they have gone co-ed in the last few years. Uh, they sold the place to the niece in 50, for $50,500, and they died within three years of each other. Hannah in 32, Elizabeth in 29, Catherine in 29. They're in the Belmont section of Laurel Hill West, but look who their oops, who their neighbor is. Frank Flair, the guy who invented bubblegum. <laughs> He's right behind. All I could think of is the the Shipley sisters, you know, were they were they pulling Flair's bubblegum from out under the desks? Uh, the Shipley School has expanded. It has. It's really big now. This is Henry Richard Dietrich, industrialist and collector. His burial spot is in Franconia, and under the bubble here is the Cardiza, the Charlotte Cardiza mausoleum, right across the street. I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to go back to William Luden. 
And William Luton lived in Reading, Pennsylvania. He started making mushy in his kitchen in Reading. It's, it's an Amish candy that's made out of molasses and brown sugar. He started that in 1879. He made a bunch of animal shapes for Christmas, which did not sell very well. So when the stuff came back, he wondered, what can I do with this? He melted it down and he put some menthol in it and he made little circular things for a sore throat and they became Luden's cough drops. Um, they went everywhere. The reason they went everywhere is because he was in Reading, Pennsylvania, which was, of course, the Reading Railroad. And what he did was very clever. He's the first person to really do guerrilla advertising. He would hand out these boxes of cough drops, nickel nickel cough drops. He'd give them to the, re, the um, um, uh, conductor, not conductor. What am I trying to? Anyway, the, the guy on the train. I can't think of who it is. Um, embarrassing and so when somebody on the train would have a cough or something the could yeah it is conductor the conductor would would give him a cough drop and the guy would hey that's really good and he'd go out and buy his own cough drop so he started this guerrilla advertising campaign that went all over the united states and all he had to do was give the um give the folks on the train boxes of candy to carry around he was doing pretty well for himself by the way that is <laughs> That is a Reading Terminal in Philadelphia on Market Street. Um, there's the terminal there. And if you look at the front, you'll say, oh, yeah, now I know what that is. Now I know where I've seen that before. Right there, just a block or two from City Hall on uh, on Market Street. So Luden cough drops all over the place. 1928, it was sold to Food Industries of Philadelphia that was owned by the Dietrich family. Luden, when he died, was buried with his second wife. His first wife died in Reading, and that's where she is. He married Fasig, and I'm sorry, I don't have her first name, but and remember what I said, behind this mausoleum is where Colette um, Vare is buried. Glenna, Glenna Colette Vare is buried. Now, by the time Henry was in college, this company was a behemoth. Luden's was making more than 500 varieties of candy. Candy had more than 1,200 employees. And in 1933, they sold 23.5 million pounds of candy. Father died when he was 24 years old and in business school. He'd gone to Episcopal Academy and he had uh, gone to Wesleyan, where he studied English, and then finally business school at Columbia. He was second year of business school when his father died. And at 24, he took over the business that was worth more than $100 million. There was an article about him in the Inquirer a couple of years later that said he, quote, shuns an active social life, dates occasionally. Well, Two years later, I'm sorry, the next year, he got married. He married Cordelia Frances Biddle. Um, for, yes, that branch of the Biddle family. Cornelia, what's her middle name? Who wrote The Happiest Millionaire? Drexel, Cornelius Drexel Biddle. I think one of her aunts wrote uh, the book The Happiest Millionaire, which was made into a Disney movie, of all things, starring Fred McMurray. And I assume that Cordelia was named after that aunt. Um, Cordelia and Richard had three children and then split. And Cordelia ran off to New York and started doing off-off Broadway. Um, got in with some very experimental theater stuff. Really interesting story. And after she'd done that, she became an author. And she is the author of dozens of history and mystery books, both. Uh, the one you might know is Murder at San Simeon. She co-wrote that with Patty Hearst. It's about an unsolved murder, murder that took place at San Simeon back in the 1920s. This is their daughter. This is Cordelia Dietrich. She kept her father's name and she got her mother's name. Yes, she was an Eileen Ford model for a couple of years. 
This is the son who has taken over the estate. This is Henry Richard Dietrich III. Now, what estate and what collection am I talking about? I'm talking about the Dietrich American Foundation Fund. This is perhaps the best collection of early American silver paintings, craftsmanship in the world that um, Richard managed to collect. He went by Richard. Richard managed to collect in his career. Uh, there is a one or 47 minute show on YouTube, the Trust Tour featuring the Dietrich collection that you can get a pretty good idea of what went to the Philadelphia Museum the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Yeah, this is a silver bowl by, oof, by Paul Revere. This locket painting of Washington is by James Peel. And if you flip it around, I couldn't find a picture of the other side, but some of Washington's hairs are actually in this locket. This is a colonial chair that he donated to the museum. Early American artwork, painting Josiah Quincy by John Singleton Copley. The prize possession, the prize possession, what's called the Cadwallader Wing Chair. This is considered the finest example of Chippendale colonial high style. He purchased this from Sotheby's in 1987 for $2,750,000. And then he donated it to the Pennsylvania Museum of Art. Um, he stayed active in arts and collecting, uh, kept the same hairstyle that, that just got whiter. <laughs> and he died in Chester Springs at age 69 of melanoma. Cordelia is still very much alive. I emailed her and asked if I could talk to her um, because I want to do a podcast on Richard one of these days. I haven't done one yet. She declined. She was not interested in talking about her life with him. Uh, but I thought I would throw in because she is a, she's an important writer now and you should know about her <laughs> all that money and this is where he is buried it's, it's a plot it's an open plot there's his father there's his mother there's henry there's his brother that's what his stone looks like now the next time you go to pma look for his name and you're going to see it all over the place and realize that you hadn't noticed it before his brother william brown who's buried here has his name on the college of physicians building last time i was at the college of physicians or the the uh, mother i was in the herb garden and back as i was walking back in there's a plate on the wall outside that says the w braun dietrich contribution that's a you know, that's what his brother did with his money in donating it. Moving on to Beatrice Fenton, whom I said before, is probably only second to Harriet Frischmuth as far as female sculptors in the early part of the 20th century. She is tucked down here into Pencoid. There is the conservatory. You walk down the hill. Here's the, the path. Walk down here, and she's right down at the bottom here. Across the street is the guy McKinley. Uh, the ad man who came up with the name for sneakers for soft-soled shoes. This is her father, Thomas Hanover Fenton, a pen med, 77. He became an ophthalmologist. Thomas Eakins was a personal friend. Eakins did a portrait of him. And he went to work at the Stetson Hospital. He was in charge of the Stetson. I'm sorry, he was in charge of ophthalmology at the Stetson Hospital. The only picture I could find of Beatrice's mother. I'm sorry, it's an old one. Um, but um, they got married in 1885. Beatrice was born in 1887. Beatrice was inspired by Rosa Bonheur. Rosa was a French animal painter. That is what she specialized in. This is a portrait of Rosa, but it's an unusual portrait because Rosa drew the bull. But that's that's that was the woman that she modeled herself after. So she started to go to the zoo and draw animals there. You know, the sign's going to pop up, right? That's our furnace sighting number three. Frank Furnace was the uh, architect for the gatehouses at the zoo. 
So her father showed these paintings to Eakins and these sketches. He said, too flat, too flat. Go work with clay, learn three dimension. However, Eakins thought enough of her that he painted her. This is Beatrice when she's 19 years old. The, the portrait is not called Beatrice Fenton. It's called the Coral Necklace. But that is indeed Beatrice. 1903, she registered at PAFA with this guy, uh, Alexander Sterling Calder. Um, no, not at PAFA. I'm sorry, School of Industrial Art. He was at the School of Industrial Art then. PAFA was Charles Grafley. He's next. If you want to hear more about Calder and his family, Biographical Bites from Bala. No, um, All Bones Considered, number 18, not Biographical Bites from Bala. That's a typo. This is Charles Grafley. Charles Grafley taught at PAFA, and Beatrice studied under him for eight years, from 1904 to 1912. While she was there, she met this woman, whom I think is stunning. This is Marjorie Martinet, and Beatrice and Marjorie became lifelong partners. 50 years. They exchanged letters back and forth. They spent time with each other whenever they could. Now, her works were shown at PAFA almost every year. After she studied there, her works were shown almost every year from 1911 to 1964. This, of course, is the Furnace Alert number four, because Frank Furnace designed PAFA. And the first time you go to Paffy, you're probably going to get hung up on the architecture before you get to the paintings and the statues, because the architecture is so magnificent. It really is Furnace's crowning glory, I think. Um, she won the George D. Widener Award for the Seaweed Fountain in 1922, and that's what you see here. That's called the Seaweed Fountain. George Dunton Widener, of course, went down with the Titanic. This is where the seaweed fountain lives today, in a garden in where in South Carolina? Oh, I didn't put the name of it down. But that's, a, that's in a public garden in South Carolina. Now, she succeeded Samuel Murray as instructor in sculptor at the Moore College of Art and Design. She taught at Moore from 42 to 53. Murray is the guy who's not buried at Laurel Hill, unfortunately. He's the guy who did the statue of Joseph Lighty that greets you outside the uh, Academy of Sciences. He's also the guy who did the statue, this gets, this gets complex, um, of James Windrum for the Smith Arch, which Windrum designed. Windrum is buried at Laurel Hill West. I haven't done a podcast about him. However, on Tuesday, September 24th, just jot it down. You'll be hearing more about it. I'm doing another virtual tour. This one is on Memorial Hall and the Smith Memorial Arch and all of the um, connections with Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West. I like doing these virtual tours, especially on artists, painters, sculptors, architects, because I can show you pictures. And it's so hard to show pictures when you're walking around the cemetery. So you're going to see a lot of pictures on, on the virtual tours that I do. I mentioned Harriet Frischman. This is Harriet's work. Harriet usually modeled nubile women. Fenton preferred to use children as models. Uh, this is in the Met in New York, by the way, the Harriet, Harriet Frischman. Harriet is buried in South. Uh, I talked about her in a podcast also. But um, Beatrice also did medallions. Many of her statues were small, or I mean, comparatively small, and they were used for fountains. Here you can see the dolphins. Um, maybe this is a star thrower. I think that predates the Lauren Isley, though. This one you would recognize. That's the one that's in Rittenhouse Square. That's the Evelyn Taylor Price Memorial Sundial. And that was a commission for Beatrice in 1947. She also did, besides children and fountains, she did traditional busts, and she did a good job of them also. But as I said, she and Marjorie exchanged letters with either, each other for the rest of their life, and there was no hiding their love for each other. They really did write magnificent love letters. I'm not going to leave them there for you to look at. If, when, when the... Uh, 
when the copy goes on YouTube, you, you can look at it more closely then if you want to. I am sad to say that Marjorie is in an unmarked grave. First of all, she and Marjorie, I mean, Mar I mean, not Marjorie, Beatrice. Beatrice is in an unmarked grave. Beatrice and Marjorie are not buried together, as was so true of so many same-sex couples up until just a few years ago. But she doesn't even have a marker. What she has, there's a footstone right about there. I think you can see the footplate there. Remember I told you, you walk down the sidewalk. There it says F. And then she's buried in here in the plot with no other marker. However, she's buried very close to that Celtic cross with 72 snakes on it. That is Alexander Sterling Calder's final resting place, plus Alexander Milne Calder, both of them sculptors. Um, so one of her instructors is just buried a few feet up the hill from her at Laurel Hill West. Two more. William Wagner was a son of a cotton merchant. He was a self-taught scientist, and he is buried in the river section, although our software is confused. Uh, our software has buried him buried two different places. I have thoroughly searched Landown. He is Lansdown. He is not here. He's over here in the river section. Um, Anna Jarvis, Mother's Day, is buried right about here. Uh, uh, Horace French, uh, I'm sorry, Horace Whitman of uh, Whitman Chocolates is buried right about here. So he's tucked back a little bit from those two. There's the uh, conservatory right there. He was a businessman. He worked for Stephen Girard and he learned from Stephen Girard. This is a portrait he had done by Thomas Sully when he was a young businessman. But because he worked for Girard, he traveled and he got interested in natural science and he started collecting things. He gathered flora and fauna and he spent 22 years working for Girard. He married Louise Binney, who had her own fortune. And he retired at 44, a very wealthy man, and then went on a two-year tour of Europe, bringing a lot of his flora and fauna with him and ex excuse me, exchanging it with people in Europe that he encountered. He had this building made. The architect on this was John MacArthur Jr., the guy who later did City Hall, who's buried in the South Section at Laurel Hill East. But he had this built to display his collection and to leave it open to people. Where is it located? This is a modern map. I'm going to show you another map in a few minutes. This is it right here. Wagner Free Institute of Science. Look at this. Montgomery Avenue, Temple University, Wachman Hall, Pearson and McGonagall Hall. It's right there. It's a, it's, it's a five minute walk from the Temple campus to this magnificent Victorian museum. This is what greets you on the outside, a nice friendly sign. And uh, sometimes the door is locked. You have to buzz yourself in. Nobody will bug you to pay anything. This is a free museum. And if, I mean, obviously I recommend you put 10 or 20 bucks in the, in the container, but if you don't, nobody's going to throw you out. It is truly a free museum. This is a black and white picture. I'm going to give you some close-ups in a little bit, but um, I wanted you to, Get a look at this. Um, in 1852 to 54, he started giving free lectures in his home and gave free classes in science to, quote, practical, busy, laboring people of Philadelphia. This is a better look at the building that MacArthur designed for him. This building, if you are a natural science freak, it has minerals. It has anemones. It has full skeletons, including a saber-toothed tiger. It has taxidermied, taxidermized, excuse me, taxidermized specimens, including the ivory-billed woodpecker, which may or may not be extinct. There are apparently sightings of it in Louisiana recently. In the back corner, there's a dinosaur or parts, little parts of a dinosaur. This is literally row after row of display case. It is absolutely astonishing that this is still there and it still looks like it did in 1895. In addition to the free education that he is supplying here, he literally gave free education. 
at the Wagner Institute, you had a series of lectures to choose from in either the fall or, well, both the fall and the spring section. And in the spring course, Monday, chemistry, Tuesday, A&P, Wednesday, geology, Thursday, natural philosophy, Friday, astronomy, Saturday, elocution, and then botany excursions in the afternoon, all free. And they were very popular. This is where they took place. This room kind of looks like it did 120 years ago. Uh, there's not a big difference here. There's about 200 chairs here. Under the chairs, you'll see a rack. That's so the gentlemen can put their hat under the seat. Show you that. That's probably my favorite part of this room. That is the magic lantern slide, the, our slide projector. And every year in October, there is a free demonstration where people from other historical units bring their magic, their glass slides, and they show the glass slides. This is probably the only place in town you're going to see glass slide presentations on a regular basis. Once a year, they do it, and they're almost always full. I can't say sold out because I don't charge anything for it. Now, this is the picture on the right, obviously. But look at the number of women in there. Look at the number of women that are taking these classes, these science classes. Women were starving for an opportunity to learn. There are, um, he died in 1885. He was 89 years old. And like Stephen Girard, who was buried on the campus of Girard College, Wagner said he wanted to be buried in a crypt under the Wagner Institute. So he was buried there, but only for a few months. The board hired a new consultant. They got Joseph Lighty. Joseph Lighty is the last man who knew everything. This is a daguerreotype from 1842. Remember, the daguerreotype was invited in 1839. This is the first photo taken inside a museum that we know of. Now, this was at the Academy of Natural Sciences. I show you this picture because this is mind boggling. This is Samuel George Morton on the left. He is the skull collector. Yes, I've done a tour about him. Um, All bones considered number 28. It's called bad science. This is Joseph Leidy. This is Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe was studying mollusks at the time. In fact, the best-selling book that Edgar Allan Poe had while he was alive was a catalog of mollusks. It was not his short stories. It was not his novellas. It was not his poetry. It was a book on mollusks. When the Free Library opened in 1891, founded by Dr. William Pepper, who's buried at Laurel Hill East, um, they wanted to have branches. And the Wagner Institute stepped forward. So the first branch, now I'm not talking about the library company. The library company was 1731. It was a private library founded by Benjamin Franklin. It's still around. This is the Philadelphia Public Library founded in 1891. 1892, this branch opened at the Wagner Free Institute. When you visit today, this is the sign that directs you upstairs to the museum. It preserves that Victorian feel. After a few months of being buried under the building, his wife had a change of heart. I don't know why. I have not been able to discover why. And she had his body moved out to Laurel Hill West in the river section where I told you about before. Okay, I'm going to get a sip of water and I'm starting to wheeze. So excuse me while I take a couple of hits of the inhaler. <clears throat> okay. Got one more to go. I'm not going to make 75 minutes. I thought I could do it in 75 minutes. Bushrod, Washington, James. It was buried here in West Lawn. I was just there yesterday. This is who he was named after. This is George Washington's nephew, Bushrod Washington, who was Associate Supreme Court Justice from 1798 to 1822. The James Patriarch came to the New World in 1683 from Wales, purchased land from Penn, 
And uh, he and the people who bought this land named it after their Welsh home, Radnorshire. So that's where Radnor Township comes from, is Bushrod James's family. That was his father's side. Mother's side was Potts. And uh, they came to the New World. Uh, and great, 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 great grandfather, John Curlis, founded Pottstown. His grandfather, Isaac Potts, established an iron iron foundry, which he called Valley Forge. So he came both sides of the family, been here forever. He went to Central High and its original place, Juniper, near Market. When he was visiting Niagara Falls while he was in high school, he slipped on a rock and almost fell in. Now, his father was a homeopath. And he followed the steps of his father. This is not his father. This is Constantine Herring. Constantine Herring is the father of homeopathic medicine in the United States. He, of course, is buried at Laurel Hill West. And I did a podcast about him, All Bones Considered Number 17. You can learn about him. Not only that, he got to take anatomy lessons from David Hayes Agnew, who was the chief anatomist in Philadelphia at the time. Um, who who'd sort of taken that role over from uh, Gross, Samuel Gross. Um, and yes, I did a podcast about Agnew. He became an eye specialist at Children's Homeopathic Hospital for 17 years. He was a pacifist, but he volunteered and he was a battle surgeon at Antietam and Gettysburg. He even wrote about his experiences, Echoes of Battle. He worked hard with this man, Alfred Steele. Alfred Steele was one of the two co-founders of the American Medical Association. He's buried at Laurel Hill East in the South Section. But they weren't working on the American Medical Association. They were working on getting women into homeopathic classes. The, uh, the other medical schools, Penn didn't take women. Jefferson didn't take women, um, not until much later than this. Of course, Women's Medical College started up, so they would take women. But by 1900, 12% of practicing homeopaths in the United States were women. Here's, here's your little trivia question. We'll take a minute or two, not a minute. But last medical school to have men and women together in the United States, last, last medical school to integrate men and women together. And the first thing that most people say is Jefferson. And it's a trick question because Jefferson was indeed the last medical school to take women. But I said, integrate men and women. Last one was women's medical college. They didn't take men until the 1970s. This is a place he visited that, that uh, James visited in 1870, he vacationed in Oakland, California, which had about 10,000 people at the time. And he bought several acres of land and then just sort of let the city use it as a park. He wasn't sure what he was going to do with it, but he had, he had, I think, seven acres of land in Oakland, California. He practiced. He wrote a lot of books, both, both fiction and nonfiction. This one, Alaskana, sold very well. He started his own eye hospital, which eventually folded into the Wills Eye Hospital. And then he died relatively young. He was only 66 when he died in 1903. He was buried at Monument Cemetery. Now, let me show you this. This is, there's the Wagner Free Institute again. There's the Grand Opera House. There is Monument Cemetery. Monument Cemetery is across the street. Temple Temple isn't here. Here it just says the temple. But Monument Cemetery was right across Broad Street from Temple University until the 1950s when Temple bought the land and quote unquote relocated all the bodies. And if family was not available to claim a body, they all went to, I believe, Mount Eden. No. Yeah, the, the bodies went to Mount Eden. I believe it, it might have been another peripheral cemetery. Um, but Dr. James had given money to the city for a library 
and there was enough money left after the library that somebody at City Hall had the good sense to have him moved from Monument to Laurel Hill West. This is a house in Tennessee. This used to belong to the American Temperance University. It's in Harriman, Tennessee. And Bushrod donated this house. Uh, obviously, the university's been out of business for a long time. Uh, it was used as the Hall of Domestic Science for young ladies. Now it is a bed and breakfast. You can see it right here. Bushrod Hall, established 1892. So should you ever go to Harriman, Tennessee, you can stay in Bushrod's house that he donated. He also, the money that he donated to the city went to the Bushrod Library, which is up on Castor Avenue in the northeast part. Now, what about that land in Oakland? This is really cool. He left the land to the city, and they built Bushrod Ball Fields. And do you know who grew up playing at Bushrod Ball Fields? Uh, these two guys, Frank Robinson, Ricky Henderson, Veda Penson, all these guys learned to play baseball at Bushrod Field. It was even a Bushrod League for a while. Now, I told you that the bodies were moved to another cemetery from Monument. All of the stones were dumped down under the Tacone Bridge. And a lot of people have been studying these. Ed Snyder, who's another taphophile, uh, does a lot of photography, a lot of writing. He has a blog about the cemetery traveler, has done a YouTube. This is from YouTube, a uh, screen cap. You can go see about these stones that are now down at the river that can only be visited at low tide. This is where Bushrod is buried at Laurel Hill West. Um so those are the 10 I had for 2024. I'm three minutes over what I thought. Okay, 2025, I've already got a plan, although this is subject to change, but probably not. Harold Kinnear, this is the grandson of Constantine Herring. In fact, his middle name is Herring. Uh, there's the H. And he did, he drew the Cats and Jammer Kids for many, many years. If you, if you remember the evil gang in the Cats and Jammer Kids, it was the Herring Boys. Ha. <laughs> Hannah Clothier Hall, the son of the daughter of the founder, one of the founders of Strawbridge and Clothier, who was a pacifist and a, uh, a feminist and a suffragette. Uh, she's buried with the Clothier family. Fascinating story. Charles Benjamin Dudley, who was into precise measurements. He'll make a very good story. Major General Isidore Ravden, who was in charge of the hospital at the Burma China India Theater and worked his way up to uh, Major General. Fascinating story, also. Speaking of clothiers, this is Hannah's brother, William Sr., who is in the Tennis Hall of Fame. And then his son, William Jr., also played tennis, but he did it mostly so he could spy. He was also a member of the CIA. This woman, Ruth Enney, you know her better as Mama Dietz. Fascinating story. Giuseppe Del Puente, the premier baritone in America in the late 19th century, sang at the opening of the Metropolitan Opera in New York and was in an unmarked grave in Laurel Hill West for more than 50 years. Annie Inglis died very young. She gave her most precious gift to her mother and said, start a house for people like me. And she did. At first, it was called the Home for the Incurables. Now it's known as Inglis House. Uh, the gift, by the way, was a $1 gold piece. Jocko Henderson, uh, not only one of the great disc jockeys, but one of the pioneers of rap music. And then Septimus Winter, a 19th century composer who wrote Listen to the Mockingbird, Ten Little Indians, Where, Oh, Where Is My Little Dog Gone, and so many others that you would know is buried at Laurel Hill West. As promised, that's where, that's the names of the podcast. There is my email address if you want it. There is my website. And come back to the QR code in case you want to just scan that. It'll take you straight to the podcast.
So thank you for listening. We got any still no questions, but we still got the same number of participants. We didn't lose anybody. I am open for questions. I am open for suggestions. And if you think of any questions after the fact, um, or as you're rewatching the recording, uh, Dr. Lex did provide his email address and he is very open to answering all of your questions. He's very gracious about it with me while I'm still learning too. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, well thank, thank you, you for coming out. Yep. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Lex, for your wonderful presentation. Um, I mm -hmm. will get these recordings out within a few days to everybody. Um, and remember okay. to uh, keep checking out Dr. Lex's podcasts and all of his other endeavors, and also to keep your eyes on our website for the upcoming programming season and all the fun things we're going to be doing. All right. Stay safe, stay well.